Hi, I'm Searcy Wessner. I'm the director and founder of the Museum of the American Military Family in Tejeras, New Mexico, and I am a member of the Museum's Veteran Family Community Collaborative. Our goal is to provide outreach and education to military and veteran families wherever they are. We do that through programming virtually like this one and also at the museum. Today's guest is Wynne Park, who is a physician assistant and a nutrition outreach fellow with the PA Foundation. Over the next month, she and other nutrition outreach fellows are going to be presenting interesting and relevant programs to you via our VFCC. Welcome, Wynne. Hi, Cersei. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wynne, as Cersei said, um, and I'm a PA who works with patients who have kidney disease. Um, I actually really love talking about healthy aging because all of us are aging and um, every day, obviously, and it's an important topic to cover with everyone. Um, one of my grandmothers lived to be 100, the other one lived to be 92, um, and so I wanted to share what I know to keep us all living healthy um, and longer, but in a healthy way. So well, let's get started. As I figure out how to advance the slides. <laughs> well, I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, we all want to live better, healthier lives. Oh, absolutely. And if I can help people to do that, um, that's, that's my goal in life. Okay, so let's start with um, aging in the United States. So um, by 2020, which is already passed, obviously, uh, one in six of the um, citizens in the United States will be older than 65. Um, by 2030, 25% of us will be uh, greater than 65. Um, and what goes along, unfortunately, with um, getting older sometimes, are um, the problems that you see below um, or here, high blood pressure, arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. That's, and so, that's I'm sorry, go ahead. What did you say? I said, it's really frightening. 71% of us are going to get high blood pressure. Wow. Yeah, that is, that's a little scary. Um, and um, I mean, the nice thing is, is that, um, Adults who reach the age of 65 are usually estimated to live at least another 19 years, which sounds pretty good, but um, actually compared to other developed countries, um, this is less than in comparison um, in regards to the United States. Um, so anyway, um, so let's talk about these conditions. Um, if you um, have one of these conditions, um, you know, I can't see you, but you could raise your hand. And then if you have just one of these conditions, um, put your hand down. So we know that not everybody who ages has all of these same health conditions. These are just risks. And okay, now everybody can put their hands down. We know that heart disease is the leading cause of death um, in um, America. And we know that there's actually um, a lot that we can do to help prevent that. And so that's part of what we're, we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, so everybody ages, um, as I said, but um, not everybody ages at the same rate. So there's this whole spectrum of where people are in their age or in their health as they age. Um, and there are a lot of factors that play into it. Genetics, you know, you, people may have different um, comorbid conditions, different health behaviors, um, but uh, we know that even genetics can be sidetracked. So um, in our next picture, take a look at these uh, women so these are actually identical twins. Um, and as we said before, genetics, health behaviors and environmental exposures. I think you can guess which one of them was a smoker and which one of them was also a sun lover. And so some of their health behaviors and lifestyles contributed because with genetics, we know that um, identical twins should have the same genetics when they start out. Um, and so there are a lot of, um, positive things that we can do in terms of our, our behaviors to help us with um, healthy aging and versus unhealthy aging. Okay, so what's the whole point? Now everybody kind of knows when we're talking about healthy aging, what it means, right? We think 
everybody has their own definition. So in my definition, I say it allows us to do all the things we want to do as we get older. Um, and of course, if we're lucky, we are all getting older. And it's different for every person, right? So for some people, um, they might just consider healthy aging meeting basic needs or being autonomous or being able to be mobile. Some people look at healthy aging as being able to develop healthy relationships or being able to contribute to society. Um, it's really determined by your abilities, your own, own intrinsic abilities, and then the environment that you grew up in. And um, what can happen when you age? Um, what are some of the things that maybe you've observed, Cersei, have you seen in, in people who are aging? Well, I noticed that about the time I turned 45, when I would be sitting on the floor and standing up, I would get a sharp pain. So I realized <laughs> right. that, that I was beginning to age. So I would say um, probably a little arthritis is going on for me. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Luckily, I don't have any of the other symptoms, but I try to eat as well as I possibly can. And that's a really good point. But it's true; some things do catch up to us. And then um, for people, um, you know, you and I both were um, involved with a lot of veterans, and veterans do a lot of um, activities that can be hard on the body. And so you know, the the wear and tear from all of the activity and all of the 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 strenuous and um, things that they've been exposed to can definitely um, cause um, aging to accelerate beyond um, what maybe not, might have been expected. And so that's why it's definitely important for our veteran population and for their families too, mm -hmm. who are under often under a lot of different stresses. Okay, so unhealthy aging, obviously, not being able to do what you want to do as you get older. And the, some of the scary things are things like dementia, um, trouble walking, trouble getting up off the floor, as you said, <laughs> um, trouble balancing, um, and then the chronic diseases, like the ones that we had talked about. So um, those are all elements of aging that probably concern all of us. None of us want to be in a position where we're experiencing any of these things. Um, but as I said, there's stuff that we can do to help us to prevent um, and avoid or at least push these things further on down the road. Hopefully we never uh, run into them. Okay, um, the other other things that might be related to um, unhealthy aging besides the kind of physical things we talked about, um, isolation and loneliness, which is really important. Um, you know, we have to be thinking about our mental health as well. Um, and that often happens, unfortunately, as we get older, you know, as um, members of our, our peer group um, get busy with what they're doing, with their lives, with their families, you know, or maybe uh, they may pass away or you drift away from friends, you know, it, it can be difficult to, to maintain those friendships. Um, malnutrition is one topic that people don't think about that um, often happens in people who are older. Um, you know, when you're a little bit younger and you've got kids and you have to make sure that they're eating healthier, sometimes that rubs off on you, hopefully, and you're, you know, you're making sure they're getting a balanced diet. But then as you get older and your kids are out of the house or, you know, you might not necessarily be um, being as vigilant about your nutrition. And then some, just some basic um, activities of daily living that you might have trouble with as you get older. Things like just getting plates out of the cabinet or grabbing your silverware from the drawer or even just getting out of the bathtub or the shower. And then those are the types of things that impact our ability to live alone which and independently, which I think is a scary thought for a lot of people. Okay, so let's talk about how um, healthy aging and, um, age, I'm sorry, aging itself affects the, the body um, and looking at different systems of the body. So if you look at the heart and lung, um, we know that you can get heart attacks, you could get short of breath, you could have pain um, when you're doing activity. Um, when you're looking at the dietary system, um, you could experience tooth loss. And, uh, you know, that's not uncommon that you have people who um, have difficulty with um, their dentition. And then because of that, uh, it makes it harder to eat. So my dad, um, he grew up during um, the Korean War and had very poor nutrition while he was growing up. And because of that, he has actually, he had really, really poor dentition and his, a lot of his teeth were loose and 
um, it, it made eating really difficult for him. And so um, when you can't eat the things that um, you like, you know, you kind of resort to things that are easier. And sometimes the easier foods are processed foods, which aren't necessarily good for you. Mm. Um, you can start dealing with um, issues related to constipation. Um, in your hormones, um, you know, all of us have um, estrogen and progesterone and t testosterone in our lives. And um, that's part of what determines our, our, um, uh, our ability to be, um, um, you know, the way, I'm sorry, my daughter's coming in talking to me <laughs> totally threw me off here of zoom we have to love it <laughs> yeah i'm just hoping that, that my dog doesn't also suddenly start barking well you know if if the slides get too much just put the dog up and let us all look at the dog <laughs> <laughs> okay sure she would love that actually all right so again um aging can affect our hormones and we know how that can be and you know people going with, with through with hot flashes and then it can affect your your sex life which is an important part of everybody's life um those hormones also affect our skin which you know affects um in terms of everybody thinks about wrinkles um but it also has to do with elasticity of the skin um and um, we also know that um, our nervous system can be affected so we could have poor vision, you know, everybody's got the readers out now. Um, and because you might be on medications, your um, sense of taste and smell might be um, affected. And um, you also, as we talked about, dementia may be a concern. Um, you and I, had to, we had just talked about, you know, joint pain um, when you're getting up or, but one of the things that also can occur is loss of muscle mass um, and then lower bone mass. Um, so you're, we're dealing with things like osteoporosis. Okay, so next issue. Um, as I said, it's really important. Nutrition and aging is really, really important. Um, we want to make sure that um, you have all of the vitamins and minerals you need to be able to have the healthy body that you need to be able to um, age gracefully, as they say it. But I, you know, as I say, it's all about determining what's important to you. How do you want to age? Um, what do you want to, healthy aging to look like for you? The main thing is you want to prevent chronic disease, right? Because with all of those things um, come all of the risks of, of um, increased mortality. Um, but I think it's not just about um, you know those things. It's also about improving your social life and making sure that you have all of the, the interactions with the people that you love and that you want to be associated with. Um, sorry, that's my dog. Um, <laughs> who, uh, you know, like you, you have to maintain those social connections because quality of life is the most important thing. You know, I was, um, I was reading somewhere that if people can't hear well, if they don't have their hearing aid, that makes them isolate, which then can add to dementia and dementia and depression and, and things like that. Absolutely true, yes. And some of the things that people don't think about is that your nutrition actually plays a role in your vision and hearing. It's all part of everything that's related to your body, right? And But we don't we don't tend to think about that. We, we think about food as something that fills our belly instead of thinking about nutrition as the building blocks to making sure we have a healthy nervous system, which helps us to have healthier um, eyes and better vision and better hearing. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we kind of talked about this already. What happens with poor nutrition? You can't move as well. Um, we get that loss of independence if you're not able to drive because of vision, maybe because maybe you've got some neuropathy going on in your feet, and then you're not able to feel the brakes or the the gas as well. Um, as we talked about dementia, we talked about the problems of losing your teeth and then the loss of taste and smell. I mean, if you think about how much smell affects what we like to eat, um, that, you know, that's something that people don't think about is also affecting their nutrition status. And um, again, a lot of that can be related to medications that come from having to take care of these chronic health conditions. Okay, so we want you to consider how you eat. And this um, is a little, there's a video here. I don't know if you wanna play it or not. Well, let's see, we can give it a shot. Okay, let's try it. Um,
I am not sure. It's Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good. There we go. Can you see this? Well, I can see the, it's a Nutrition is a big factor in maintaining your good health. Your healthcare provider may ask you to complete a 24 hour dietary recall so they can get a better idea of your eating habits. This may occur in routine diabetes care in preparation for surgery or in maintaining your weight, strength, and energy. You'll be more successful with a diet and lifestyle program if it's created specifically for you based on your usual food preparation and meal or snack schedule. A 24-hour dietary recall begins first thing in the morning and includes everything you eat and drink in a 24-hour period. Yes, everything. You'll get a handout that has three columns, time of day, food and drink, and amount. Throughout the 24 hours, write down the time, the specific type of food and drink you consumed, and how it was prepared. Include meals and snacks. Your provider may request that you complete a three-day dietary recall as well. Repeat the same process, but over three days instead of 24 hours. Here's an example of what an accurate dietary journal looks like. If you had eggs, toast, and coffee for breakfast, write two fried eggs cooked in one tablespoon of olive oil, one slice of whole wheat toast with one teaspoon of butter, one eight ounce cup of coffee with one ounce of nonfat creamer. The dietary recall is most helpful when it reflects a typical day. Don't adjust your consumption to make your diet appear more healthy. Your provider is counting on you to be honest and will not judge you for your choices. You're on a journey, and this is the first step. Okay, so let's okay. go back to... Well, I, we didn't see the whole the thing, but we there was good information. I mean, yeah, I would probably totally cheat. You know, oh, I want my doctor to think I'm eating you know, six servings of vegetables. <laughs> right. I don't know about the licorice. <laughs> That's really funny. Did you know, actually, um, real licorice, when you're, if you consume a lot of it, it can increase your blood pressure. No, yeah, that's, uh, that's the real licorice, the, the, from the root. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah the black, I think it's uh, the black licorice is one of those things that you have to consume quite a bit of it, mm -hmm. but um, it, it definitely can affect it. Um, and so that's why it's really important for um, providers to be able to see what you actually eat, because we can catch things like that. Um, and we can see if there are nutrients that you might be missing. And so um, these things are what we actually need more of. Now, they did a survey of older adults, and they found that older adults are only meeting about 66% of their dietary needs. Um, luckily, we can look at uh, our um, food labels to be able to see what's uh, missing. But a good food diary will enable your provider to look at it and say, well, I notice you're only having, you know, dark green or leafy vegetables, maybe, you know, once a day, or you're not getting any whole grains, or, you know, maybe your diet's a little bit low in calcium. So that's really important for us to be looking at, um, because all of the, all of these nutrients are definitely things that we need more in our, of in our diet and healthy, and for um, healthy aging, it's really important. Unfortunately, what we need less of is the stuff that Probably people think, oh, this tastes better because we want salt in our diet and fat um, and sugar and alcohol, of course, is one of the things that people might be um, including in their diets. Um, what we want to avoid is the saturated fat. Um, and we want to make sure that we have less than two grams of salt a day, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, but two grams is um, is is a lot more than we need physiologically. We actually, actually, if you follow what's called the DASH diet, um, uh, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, and that's 1300 milligrams or 1 1.3 grams of salt a day, um, that's as effective as one blood pressure medication. Wow. So yeah, it's, uh, diet can be really, really powerful in helping us to um, take care of ourselves. Now, I would never recommend anybody go off any of their medications without the, you know, discussing it with their providers first. But it's one tool that people overlook as being helpful for taking care of um, their, their health concerns. So 
So again, what we talked about, what we need more of, um, more whole grains, more fiber, more fruits and vegetables, definitely. All right, and let's see here. So between 2007 and 2008, um, diets of those between the ages of 65 and 75 were um, evaluated. And that's where they came up with this whole um, discussion about how only 66% of all the nutrients that we need are actually covered. Um, but they found that if you eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables daily, um, avoid excessive alcohol, um, and stop or never use um, tobacco, you could increase your longevity by as much as 10 years. So, so when I know this is going to sound really silly, but I know some people consider ketchup to be a vegetable because it's tomatoes, you know, and if they use a lot of it, does that count as a serving? Not just because it has also a lot of um, sugar in it. Um, they do make ketchup that's, that has no sugar. Um, actually, I bought this ketchup, it's called, um, which sounds silly, it's called veggie ketchup because of course ketchup is made out of vegetables, right? But it actually can ser contains um, increased servings of fruit, uh, vegetables in it, like beets and carrots and those kinds of things. They use those, all of those um, and it has an increased fiber content. So I think, I, I guess I should revert my answer to saying uh, it depends. It depends on what kind of ketchup you're using. If you're using one that's full of high fructose syrup, I wouldn't consider that a great fruit or vegetable. And tomatoes are actually vegetables or fruits. I mean, okay, you, cool. from a logical standpoint. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Um, we need mono unsaturated fats. So we do need to have fats in our diets and we do need to have proteins in our diets. Um, and actually a lot of older adults are on what we call like the tea and toast diet where you're just eating a lot of carbs and not enough protein. And protein um, are the building blocks of, of um, everything that we need. So if you can revert to more plant proteins like quinoa, peanut butter, um, almond butter, actually um, sunflower seed butter is um, more sustainably um, uh, produced than almond butter is. So um, there's definitely ways that we can look at trying to get more protein in our diet. Um, so men in particular had a 12% lower risk of death for every 10 grams of protein um, plant protein that they use per 1000 calories that they consumed. Um, and they think that the benefits could increase um, if they ate even more plant protein. So switching more to the plant-based protein is definitely important. And sometimes people think, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of kind of the fake meat. You know, um, the plant-based protein, you have to think about things like beans. Um, and as I said, quinoa has it. So there's protein in things that you, we don't think about. When you say beans, you mean like kidney beans and pinto beans, that kind of beans, right? Okay. Yes, definitely. Now, these are things we already talked about, processed foods. Um, and in fact, they've done studies that show that the more processed foods you eat, the lower, um, the, the shorter your lifespan. So as it's a, it's a, a um, what do you call it? Like a actually dose based. So the more processed foods you eat, the shorter your life will be. Wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you can cut back to no processed foods, that will definitely help to increase your longevity. Um, and then, of course, um, we know that sugar contributes to increased inflammatory processes in our diet, in our bodies. And a lot of um, what they're determining um, in terms of like um, diabetes and heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, some of the uh, autoimmune diseases are related to inflammatory processes. So if we can cut back on our sugars, we can, you know, not contribute to those problems. And the white breads and grains, what they tend to do are, they're just very starchy. They have no fiber content, um, you know, and in my um, culture, of course, white rice is a huge part of it. Um, and so, um, getting people to switch over to brown rice can be very difficult because it's a cultural thing. And that's one of the things that, you know, we can talk about in future conversations about how cultural considerations of, of diet are really important as well. Um, in the same way, salt, um, as, as I said, you know, you wanna decrease your amount of salt, but one tablespoon of salt is, I'm sorry, one tablespoon of soy sauce is equivalent to your entire daily amount of salt that you need in a day for anybody more actually a little bit more than what you need in it. And um, we use a lot of um, 
soy sauce in um, our cooking. And so, you know, that's something that we have to talk to um, our different communities about. Um, and same thing with alcohol, you know, they recommend no more than one drink per day for women and no more than two drinks per day for men. And they don't mean like drinks, you know, the big giant drinks, they mean drinks. <laughs> so, um, and we need to talk about saturated fat as well. Okay, so let's move on to our next slide. Now, we've been talking about nutrition, but if you add exercise, you can really, really ramp up um, the benefits. Um, we know that exercise can help you build up muscle. Um, it can help you um, with actually, they think that when you exercise, it decreases your risk of developing dementia. And you know you get all those great endorphins with working out. And so it helps you um, in terms of your mental health. Um, it helps you to um, decrease your um, sugar levels if um, you're dealing with diabetes. Definitely helps with moving your bowels. And then um, it helps with loneliness. And so if you're working out, you know, people are working out more at home, obviously, since the pandemic. But I think people are starting to get out. And I actually see more people walking now, I think, because they are in, stuck in their house so much. And so they want to get out walking. And they're, you know, some of them are walking with masks still and everything or walking their dog. But really, if you want to exercise it, that, that, that can really bump amp up the, the benefits. So um, I wanted to share with you this picture of, um, and she's, and Ernestine is just such an inspirational um, person. So um, you can start exercising at any time, right? Everybody's kind of like, oh, I'm old, you know, I'm, or I'm, I, I just, I can't be a bodybuilder. Um, so Ernestine is 85 in this picture. So um, she started working out um, at the age of 72. So at the age of 72, she had lost, uh, when, after she started working out, she lost a total of 62 pounds. Um, she's run 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons. She trains other senior women. Um, and she started out as she, she described herself as a well padded secretary. So not somebody who, you know, had that exercise gene. I feel like there are some people who, you know, like they, they grew up always exercising, but that wasn't her. Um, and so she, her take on exercises, you know, you can't turn back the clock, but you can definitely wind it up again. So doesn't she look great? She looks amazing. She does. Yeah. I'm inspired. Okay, no more whining about I'm too old to start something. <laughs> exactly. All of us can start. And yeah, I want arms like that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Beautiful. All right. And here's another lady. She's 74. And um, she also is one of those uh, late bloomer exercisers. Um, so she's gotten off all of her medications. Um, she's not taking any blood pressure medications, acid reflux medications, cholesterol medications, and she started at 72. So she looks, she looks great, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, in only two years. What a transformation from 74 now to from 72 then. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And she really, really was, um, I forgot to mention with Ernestine, she won her first bodybuilding competition at age 71. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> So it's possible, mm. not just to lose weight, but it, to actually look amazing while you're doing it and just inspire other people. She has an Instagram account and she's, you know, constantly trying to, to help inspire other people. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. All right, um, let's see here. Can you see this little thing that's on the screen? What little thing? Okay, never mind. You can see the slide though, so that's good. Uh -huh. All right. My computer, of course, wants to update and do all kinds of fun things while we're on the podcast. Yeah, well, that's what happens. That's why you know we're we're loosey goosey here with the um, the veteran family collaborative because I'll tell you what you know you just have to be pivoting constantly. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to our next slide. So. How do we, what do we know about the research? So the research shows that um, if you do 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity exercise, um, this can definitely um, improve your longevity. Um, if you double the recommendation, you really um, can um, get extra benefits in terms of your health or if you do any combination of that. 
But I think that that can be intimidating for people. And so I always say, start with where you're at. So if you walk to the mailbox and back, do it twice in a day. If you only walk, you know, five minutes, see if you can walk seven minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's just little steps in terms of what you you feel like you can do. I think all of us can say, well, I can do two more minutes. Two more minutes isn't too bad. And so it's all about, you know, what, what works best for you as long as you're moving. And that's the main thing is to get moving and then stay moving because, um, as we all know, when you stop moving, that's when everything else seems to catch up with you. And it's not the good stuff that's catching up with you, unfortunately. So 150 minutes a week is just basically 20 minutes a day. You know, when you break it down like that, or you say, oh, just walk seven minutes, you know, it makes it sound like it's achievable. Because sometimes people start these huge projects, they buy all these log books, and then they feel bad because, you know, they didn't achieve this huge amount that they thought they needed to every day. So it's good to have bite-sized pieces to have this happen. Absolutely. And we don't want to set ourselves up for failure when you set the bar that high. You know, I mean, so my 15 year old has a pull up bar. I'll turn it so you can kind of see it. It's in the, see that in the, in the doorway there. So he has this pull up bar and he, when he first got it, he said, well, I'm going to do one a day. Okay, one a day is not bad. And now he's up to five each time, five, five um, going into the kitchen and then five going out. But you don't get there overnight. You don't start off with 10, you start off with one. That's how all of us do it. Now, from a genetic standpoint, what's interesting is that um, exercise is also important in terms of the intensity. And so that's why they say moderate intensity or vigorous intensity. And again, you have to work your way up to it. But if you do something that's called um, interval training, we know that what happens on the molecular level is that the telomeres, which are, now the shorter your telomeres get, the shorter your lifespan can be. That's, that's kind of the way that they've related it. But when you do interval training, you can actually help to lengthen those telomeres. It's pretty amazing. When they did muscle biopsies on people who do in, um, interval training. Now, interval training sounds like it's, um, I, I guess it's like when people talk about, well, I did CrossFit. And I think, oh, that seems intimidating for some people. Interval training can be as simple as you walk for one minute, you jog for, you know, two minutes, and then you, you know, all, all out run for, 30 seconds. So you see how that limits, I mean, not, you, you're varying the intensity and in, in the um, amount of exercise you're doing, and you can do that all within five minutes. So, yeah, so it doesn't take very much. I, I call it the three, two, one method. So, um, you know, three minutes of walking, two minutes of um, jogging, and then maybe one minute or 30 seconds of, 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 of more intense, if you can go up to, to running. Um, or, you know, even shorter, but that's, like I said, that's only six minutes. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I, the other thing that's important that we don't always talk about is strength training. And as we saw with our two examples of um, Ernestine and, and Jan, um, the other lady, um, strength training is really important and you wanna do it at least two days a week because um, what people don't think about is when you're lifting weights, especially if you're doing free weights, you're strengthening your core muscles. And what's important about those core muscles is that's what prevents you from falling. Now, when people get into trouble, I, as I said, my grandmother lived to be a hundred. She walked everywhere. She was strong. She was a tiny little thing. Um, but when she was 99, she fell and she broke her hip. And it was just an accidental, you know, slip and fall type of a thing, but you fall and you break your hip. And she, within the next year, she went from being this really healthy, vibrant woman to, you know, being stuck in a wheelchair. Um, she developed dementia and within a year she was gone. And so, you know, that's not something that um, we want. We, don't, we definitely know that when people fall that it, it contributes to a decline in health. And so, Weight training is really important, as I said, strengthening that, that core um, because it not only, as I said, prevents you from falling, but if you fall, it enables you to get up off the floor, right? Because you have to have that core strength. Right, right. Wow. 
Yep, so balance and fall prevention at least three days a week is important and that aerobic exercise is really important. Um, and then strength training is also important, especially for us women, because it's good for bone health, right? It's weight bearing activity and that's really good for your bones. Okay, so we're just about finished here. Um, I just wanted to point people to some resources that they have in their community that maybe they are not aware of. Um, some resources with the, you know, through the federal government, there are, and as I said, we had talked about nutrition. And sometimes when people, um, as they get older, they're on a limited or fixed income, um, Meals on Wheels can be helpful. The YMCA and YWCA has resources available. And you know some of these are probably opening up more now that the pandemic is, is um, um, now that states are opening up their restrictions. Um, senior centers are a great place to, to look. Um, and maybe your local charitable or religious organization might have um, resources that you could look for. Um, and then there's all these grocery delivery services that have really ramped up um, since the pandemic. So do you have any questions? Well, I think this was really a, 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 an interesting and an informative um, se session. And I think we're going to have a lot of people who are very interested in uh, following this series. And so um, I have no questions for today. I thought there was some very um, interesting things to think about. I took some notes, you know, about like how long I should exercise or what kinds of exercise and some of the rationale behind it. Mm -hmm. So I think that this was a really um, good start to what I hope will be an interesting series. What other um, programs are you going to present on you and the other outreach fellows? So um, one of the things is um, preventing diabetes or treating diabetes if you already have it, because we know that diabetes affects your entire body. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, healthy aging, or, I'm sorry, um, nutrition around surgical procedures, because also, unfortunately, as we get older, we tend to have more procedures. And people don't realize that um, when you have great nutrition surrounding that procedure, you heal better. But it, intuitively, it makes sense. But we don't prep for surgery um, the way we should. You know, there's all this. Um, you know, you're you're usually holding food before you go into surgery, and so people don't think about food as being important to, to the recovery period. Is that the dog again? That is, yeah. She's. I think she thinks I'm done, so she's coming in to to come and bark at me, probably. <laughs> well, this would be a good time to wrap it up. Um, and I wanted to tell our listeners, I know this by now, but our museum's podcasts are supported in part by New Mexico Arts, the New Mexico Humanities Council, the Sandia Area Credit Union, and organizations like Military Brat Seal and Military Brats Registry. And so I am looking forward to a continued conversation about nutrition and aging and and um, anything else you want to help our listeners uh, how they can improve their lives. So I thank you Win Park so much for coming on the podcast this morning. And um, we've got to love Zoom with all of its background noise, but I think it was a fine performance and program anyway. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your understanding. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to share more information about diet and exercise. I think people are really interested in it. Um, and I don't know about you, but I love food. So I think it's important to make sure that we're, we're helping people be healthier by eating better food. Yes, me too. All of us love to eat. Thanks, Wynn. Take care, Cersei. <laughs>